It is a joy and a privilege to be with you this morning at St. Clement's Church. I am so grateful to Andrew for the very kind invitation, and I am delighted to be back in Toronto for the St. Clement College of Preaching, which is really one of the most remarkable ministries for preachers I've witnessed. What a gift you offer the church with this program. It is truly stunning. Thank you for your hospitality and thank you for being, on a personal note, a source of hope always for your neighbors in the South. After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white? And where have they come from? This morning we are marking All Saints Day, which is a feast the church established centuries ago in the year 609. It had become clear to the Pope at the time that with only 365 days in the year, there were too many saints and not enough dates to honor them individually, although the subtext was probably too many martyrs and not enough dates. Because in truth, saints in those days were nearly always martyrs, people who had died for their faith or because of it. The church recognized that some of those names would go down in history, St. Patrick, St. Clement, St. Agnes, but that most wouldn't. There were and are and always will be a multitude of saints known only to God. And so in what we might see as an early act of equity, diversity, and inclusion, we have All Saints Day, which is the church's attempt to honor everyone in the great cloud of witnesses, named and unnamed, up front and behind the scenes, written down in books and written only in hearts, and always in the heart of God. Today, the church honors, the church universal honors the life, work, and witness of God's people in every age, but we will also give, in many congregations, particular thanks for those in our community who have died in the past year. In my church back home today, the ministers will read the names of those saints aloud while a bell tolls once for each person who has died. Many other congregations will do something similar. And other practices as well will light candles and share communion and sing familiar hymns like For All the Saints. And we'll hear the same text from the book of Revelation, which is the reading, one of the readings, the revised common lectionary assigns for All Saints Sunday whether we like it or not. Because may I be honest here, this reading from Revelation chapter 7 is like the book of Job. It's a text that nobody wants. Please, I'm not trying to be another rudely blunt American speaking out of turn. When I say this is a text that nobody wants, I mean no lack of reverence. I have nothing but reverence for scripture and for all the saints who from their labors rest. But I am also aware that no one becomes a saint unless they have been handed the starring role in the book of Job, which is to say, terrible circumstances of unbearable loss. Job is the man who suffers through no fault of his own and struggles to make sense of it. 
The book is the original treatise on why bad things happen to good people with no clear resolution because the book of Job is the puzzle that can't be solved. No one wants that text. No one wants to live that story. But we may find ourselves in it, as Job did, thrust into a season of suffering we don't understand. Revelation chapter 7 is like that too. A text nobody wants for a context we hope never to see. In fact, the entire book of Revelation is one big apocalypse, but not in the way it's often presented or misrepresented, as the case may be. This book was written for people who were living through the most horrific oppression at the hands of the Roman Empire, violence and persecution, or what scripture calls the great ordeal. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. These first century Christians faced violence, persecution, and the constant threat of war and death because of religious differences. Because their primary allegiance was not to Caesar, but to Jesus Christ. The empire viewed them as a threat that had to be eliminated, and so they were. Huge numbers of them targeted and slaughtered in scenes as awful as the ones we've seen this week and last. To these Christian believers, it felt like the end times, the end of all hope. And so the book of Revelation was written to give them hope in language and imagery as extravagant as any poet's. The book isn't meant to be a survival manual for these people. It wasn't intended to scare them into good behavior or saintly conduct. And it definitely wasn't supposed to be their ticket out of some doctrinal damnation, which is what a lot of politicians in my area are preaching. No, this book was meant to be an alternative vision, a revealing, an unveiling, which is what apocalyptic means. The vision was a promise that in this time and context that nobody wanted, the power of the resurrection would show itself in the believer's very bodies. Gifts of the Spirit they never expected would come to strengthen and sanctify them because only in the teeth of challenge do we discover the grace of those other fruits beyond the ones we pray for, love, joy, and peace. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Texts that nobody wants, but that have to be written when the times demand it. Because 
They offer a vision the world can't give, a truth that is God's alone, resurrection truth. And as Frederick Buechner wrote, resurrection means the worst thing will not be the last thing. God is not finished with us yet. God and not Caesar will have the final word. That's the big reveal in the book of Revelation that sustains the saints of God in their great ordeal. And it's why the writer can walk us through the book of Job and a week like this one without denying or minimizing a single cry of despair. And despite that, no, because of it, compose ringing words like these. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's a new way to think about saints, that's for sure. But most of our ideas about sainthood could probably use a little expansion and even some reimagining, which is why All Saints comes around again every year. It gives us another opportunity to reflect on sanctity as less about us and more about God in us. Sanctity is a divine gift. Saints aren't people who are perfect. They aren't even people with extraordinary self-discipline. Saints are people through whom we see the light of God and the power of Christ's resurrection, even when the world feels like it is falling apart, maybe especially then. Maybe chaos is the perfect backdrop for the words of this Franciscan prayer for All Saints Day. May we be open to God making us saints. One congregation I know that prays this prayer continually is St. Gregory of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. Actually, they do more than pray it. They dance it, literally, first in worship, and then visually in this enormous circular icon-style painting called the Dancing Saints that they commissioned for their sanctuary. And here is how one of their priests describes this painting. St. Gregory's The Dancing Saints icon is a monumental, surprising, and powerful statement of faith for the ages, created by artist Mark Dukes with the people of St. Gregory's. Completed in the year 2009, it wraps around the entire church rotunda, showing 90, 90 larger-than-life saints four animals, stars, moons, suns, and a 12-foot-tall dancing Christ. The saints, ranging from traditional figures like King David, uh, Teresa of Avila, and Francis of Assisi, to unorthodox and non-Christian people like Malcolm X and Anne Frank, Black Elk and Gandhi, and Ella Fitzgerald, they represent musicians artists, mathematicians, martyrs, scholars, mystics, lovers, prophets, and sinners from all time, from many faiths and backgrounds. And as the congregation dances around the altar, the saints dance above 
proclaiming a sweeping universal vision of God shining through human life. Our idea of sainthood, this priest continues, has no moral content. Saints and sinners are the same people. We celebrate those whose lives show God at work, building a deep character to match the godlike image which stamps them as God's own from the start. Of course, this priest says God works with more than Christians, and more than Christians are saints. Gregory held that every human can progress, progress toward God. All humanity shares God's image. This is what we are made for. Our list of saints at St. Gregory of Nyssa Church includes people who crossed boundaries in ways that unified humanity, often at their own cost. Some proved lifelong models of virtue, others changed direction dramatically from evil to good, even near the end of life. Some were on the frontier of Christian thought and living and had gifts that were unrecognized or disparaged in their day, yet their gifts matter for what we do today. Others have been long revered through the world's churches. Some overcame difficult circumstances, others moved toward God despite the distractions of worldly comfort and power. Christian and Jew, Muslim, Confucian, Buddhist, Hindu, Shinto, pagan, of many continents, races, classes, and eras, these saints following Gregory from the third century lead us in our dancing as we all look upward to Jesus, the perfecter of human faith, drawing new harmony from his example. St. Gregory was radical in his fourth century day. But did you catch how the book of Revelation is as well? This last book in the Bible has its own interfaith, interdisciplinary, international, even intersectional vision of dancing saints. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. It's extraordinary, isn't it? that when the world seems to be falling apart and the end is upon them, this vision of wholeness in this book is one that includes everyone, the persecuted and their tormentors, the colonized and the empire, the hostage and the terrorist, the occupied on one bank and the invading army from the other. Indigenous, invader, migrant, landowner from north, south, east, west, and everywhere, and everyone in between, we are all there. A Pentecost of voices from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne of God, robed in white because all are pure, waving palm branches because all share a victory of peace, worshiping day and night, dancing before the throne, and God shelters each one and guides us to springs of the water of life and wipes away every tear we have ever caused one another to weep. Because the vision is sure, God is not finished with us yet. 
and resurrection means the worst that can happen is not the last that will happen. All Saints Day. Texts we don't want to hear because they signal a world we never wanted to arrive. After all, we were working for a better one. Yet here we are. And blessed be the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Amen.